Okay? All right, I'd love to welcome everybody to Juniper Level Botanic Gardens. And uh, today we're, we want to do something a little different. So we want to talk about gardeners that are new to the area, figuring out how to garden in North Carolina. Because North Carolina is quite different from a lot of other areas of the country. So I want to talk about a few things today. And I'd love to make this uh, one where you all ask a lot of questions. One of the things that people find when they move down here, number one, is they look at the soil and say, what the hell is this? Uh, especially if you move from uh, in areas up in the Midwest, especially where you have great soils. Most of the soils down here are clay, not exclusively clay. We are on beach sand here. So North Carolina has three divisions, coastal plain, Piedmont, and mountains. The coastal plain ends and the Piedmont begins at the end of our driveway. Saul's Road used to be beachfront property. So the ocean actually came to here. It's now 330 feet lower. So that's what happens. That was back when we had real global warming, not the TV global warming. Uh, so depending on what soil you have, red clay is actually a great soil. It is full of nutrients. It holds moisture really well. It's just missing organic matter. So up north where you can just dig a hole and plant something, down here, not so much. You really do need to add compost, and that's the key to making soils work. What's missing in our soil are microbes and air. Air is required for microbes to breathe. Air is required for plant roots to breathe. What we have done, even though we're on sand, same sort of thing. Our soil, it needs compost as well, because every time it rains, one day later, our soil is bone dry. Not the case in clay. Clay is a much better soil than sand. Sand is much easier to work. So on clay, in any soil, we recommend that you add at least six inches of compost to your soil. Every bed you see on our entire property is 50% native soil, 50% compost. What you don't want to do is bring in new soils on top of the crappy soils. That's no good. Then you're creating an artificial layer. And water and nutrients move based on the pull of gravity. When you don't mix whatever crappy soil you had with whatever good stuff you're adding, you create an interface problem. And the water actually goes in and stops. And it backs up and it will actually drown your plants before it reaches what's called field capacity when it then pushes the water out. So that is absolutely essential that you not just garden on top of the soil, but you, you actually mix it in together. Then you need to look at what is the pHs of soils. pH is the soil acidity. Almost every plant will grow best between a pH of six and six and a half. That's sort of the sweet spot. There's some things that require more acidic, but they will do fine at those pHs almost exclusively. There are very, very few exceptions. So you need to look and figure out what your native soil is. The soil tests are free. Department of Agriculture does this over there across from the uh, North Carolina Art Museum. Our native soil pHs here are 3.2. Now, if you know sort of acidic, okay, that's a thousand times more acidic. So if you didn't take a soil test and you're on a soil with this pH, your plant's not going to be growing very well. So soil tests absolutely matter. Then you come down to nutrients. How do you add nutrients? Uh, the key is not to think about fertilizing your plants ever. All you're interested in is feeding the microbes in the soil. That's all you care about because they feed the plants. So many people get caught up in, well, I need to add miracle Grow. I need to add this to my plant. That would be like if all you ate were Snickers bars. Would you become larger? Yes. Would you be healthy? No. So, so think about things in those terms. Feed the microbes first. All right, a, a big mistake a lot of people make is not understanding roots. So if we look at this tree, we go to the outer edge of the branches, which would be here. We drop a line down. We look, all right, well, that's 20 feet. The roots under here are support roots. They take up very little in terms of moisture or nutrients. Why would you put roots that need moisture underneath your canopy? That would be pretty stupid. Those plants start here and they go out the same distance, another 20 foot. So the roots that you actually need to care about are out here, so from here to there. So when you're doing soil prep and you prep the soil under there, no good. This is where your soil needs to be prepped. 
So it's a very common mistake in soil prep. People fertilize right under the trunk, they water right under the trunk, and they prepare the soil under there. And they don't think about where the roots are actually going to be. So think about plants in a very different manner. One of the things when people move down here they find out is temperatures are a little different than where they came from. Some people move from up south, down south. A lot of people move from up north. And they get down here and they're like, wow, this is a lot more hot, a lot more uh, warm, a lot more humid. We have warm nights. That affects the plants you grow. Many of the plants that will grow fine even from D.C. north will not grow at all here because we are too hot for too long. And this is the difference between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures. Plants during the day, they build up sugars from the sun. At night, they either use that to go into growth or they burn it up just respiring. Which is why many plants that you would see if you move here from the west coast grow ten times faster on the west coast. Because during the night, it cools down enough that all that energy that they've made can go into growth. Here, they pretty much respire it, and only a little bit grows into growth. So that's why you have to, to understand the difference. Now, hardiness zones help, but hardiness zones are not the end-all, be-all. We have zone 7, which is where we are. We're 7B. Here, we have zone 7B in Seattle. Completely different set of plants, even though we're exactly the same, because all that manage, measures is the minimum average temperature at night. That does not tell you what will actually grow in this area. So you've got to be very keenly aware. Rainfall is another thing that really matters here. Our average rainfall is 45, 46 inches a year. You want to guess what the two biggest rainfall months are? Anybody know? July and August. So any plant that has a very high respiration rate has trouble with our summer rains. Because any plant that respires a lot, it has to breathe a lot. That includes the roots. So we've had plants from Chile. I've had eight, nine foot tall Chilean trees. One July rain, I've watched the entire tree die in one hour. Because they are so fast res respiration rate, that rain hits, it pushes the air out of the soil, and in one hour that plant will be dead. So that's why, again, they do great on the west coast, but in the summertime they have no rain. They're a Mediterranean climate very different than what we see here. So the key is really selecting plants that grow in this area, not particularly what grew up north or what grew out west. Now, there's a lot of myths is what grows. One of the common ones we see are, are this plant doesn't grow. Lilacs are a great example. If you move down here and you read books, lilacs don't grow. Well, there's one lilac that doesn't grow here. The other 500 grow fine. If you notice this tree in the corner right there that's in full bloom with the white flowers, that's a lilac. That was grown from a little four inch pot, doing absolutely great. One of the things we can do down here that's very different is we can grow a lot of what we call BLEs. So if you look right behind me, if you're new to this area, this is called a BLE is the common name, broadleaf evergreen. There's a tremendous amount of those down here. The further north you move, the less broad leaves you have. Because in the wintertime, anything that has a leaf on it in the wintertime that's going to get 20 below zero with a big wind, that's not going to survive. But when we move down here, we can landscape completely differently because we have so many of these plants that hold on to their evergreen leaves through the wintertime. So in terms of, of, of moisture, uh, People say, well, should I irrigate, should I not irrigate? First thing you want to do is put the plant in the right place. That is absolutely essential. If you've got a plant that wants to be, excuse me, that likes sun, don't put it in shade. If it needs to be in, sh in shade, don't put it in sun. Getting the plant in the right place matters. But getting the moisture is absolutely critical. Some plants are wetland plants. That means they need to be in water. Now, a few are adaptable, and a lot are more adaptable than the books say, and that's a lot of what we trial at. But match your plants. The better you can match your plants, the less you need to irrigate. Now, I'm not saying you will never need to irrigate, because what irrigation does is not just important for plants, it's important for the microbes in the soil. So your microbes, okay, so one teaspoon, 300 billion living beings in every teaspoon of soil. Think about those numbers. 
if the soil gets dry, what happens? All the bacteria die. They can't survive. And then the fungus likes it dry, then they take over. Then things get out of balance. So there's a reason you water other than, oh, my plant is wilted. It's all about the microbes, and that's what we need to completely rethink what everybody does. And that's why we don't go out with a lot of chemicals on the soil. A lot of those kill your microbes. You've got to just always constantly think about uh, microbes in the area. All right, then there's, then there's when do we plant? There are more books written that say, well, you plant this this time of year, and you do this this time of year, and you do this this time of year. Forget all of that. 99.9% .9 of your plants you can plant any month of the year. We plant and we transplant every single week of the year. The only thing we will not plant in the late fall are, are agaves and bananas. They don't survive well because they have to get established before it gets cold. But 99% of the stuff, anytime you want to plant it is fine. Most things, most things, anytime you want to divide them, it's fine. We do a lot of divisions in the middle of August, 100 degrees. Yeah. We do that because they reestablish faster then than any other time. So if you divide, say, a hosta in fall and you replant it, that actually will not regenerate roots until the following April. But if you divide it in August, one week later you've got a new root system. So you have to water more but for a much shorter period of time. So down here, we, we don't, there really is, outside of those two I mentioned, there's really nothing you can't plant most of the year. Now, if you get a plant out of a tropical greenhouse, yes, don't go in and put it in fall or winter because it's not gonna be in the right growth mode. So even plants that are hardy to below zero, if they're actively growing, you can kill them at 32 degrees. So hardiness only means that plant will be hardy when it is fully dormant. So y'all are right here, we're in zone 7B. If you move a little further south, say 50 to 100 miles, you're in zone 8. Uh, zone 7 goes pretty far up. Uh, 7A would be sort of in the Hillsboro area. Uh, west to say uh, Kernersville, Greensboro area would be more 7A. There is a big difference between 7A and 7B. They are not the same zone. So when I see a catalog that says zone 7 to 9, I immediately know they have no idea what they're talking about because there is a dramatic difference between those two plants. All right, questions? Yes? Yeah, you were talking about watering. Yes. When is the best time to water? Ah. Oh, bottom or top? Or? Great, point. Great question. All right, you read books that say you should never water at night. That is the stupidest thing that humans have ever come up with. That is truly bizarre. And, and it's, been, it's, it, it's been repeated over and over again. Water whenever you have time. Now, if you water in the middle of a hot day, yes, you will have a lot of the water that will evaporate. But the idea that watering at night causes diseases is nuts. It simply is not true. That is the most efficient time to water. How much you should water is really based on your soil. Uh, you know, standard rule, most people talk about an inch uh, is pretty good. I like to do two inches to actually be sure I'm getting down to the roots because if the ground's really dry, it'll be hydrophobic. It, you can water and water and water and it takes a while just to get the surface re-wet. But uh, irrigation to me is just huge. Now, more plants are killed by over-irrigation than under, far more. So, so you've got to be careful that if you put in irrigation systems, that you manage the system. You cannot just blindly run it. You will be killing plants like crazy. Uh, that's really important. Uh, the other thing is get the plant in the right place. Uh, a lot of people still will go to a garden center and they'll buy a shrub or tree and they say, tell me how often I should prune it. The answer is never, <laughs> never. There is no reason to ever shear a plant back. That means you should buy a shovel and move it. There's heading, head, head shears are just the most bizarre thing to ever invent. That's for people that didn't have enough sense to move the plant into the right place. So what you need to realize, when you buy a plant, you look at the tag in the garden center or in the box stores and it says four by four. 
always multiply that by at least three times. They're that far off, sometimes four times. So if it says three by three, it's probably going to be nine by nine. They are that bad. So that's the problem. That's why a lot of people put plants in the wrong place. Uh, you can look, one of the famous plants down here is Lord Petalums. You'll see one right back there. The purple leaf Lord Petalum is through the path. Lord Petalum is a 25 foot tree. It is not a three foot shrub. That's what, so I mean, that's what people do. It's, it's like, okay, I can figure it out that I've got a tree planted where I need a small shrub. So we just, we're really into energy conservation. I think there's a lot of wasted energy and a lot of that is pruning plants because somebody lied to us when they sold us the plant and we got it in the wrong place. But to me, nature is beautiful. So I like to put those plants where we can really see what nature intended as opposed to what humans that like to have a sense of control wanted the plant to actually be. So it's, it's a philosophical thing, but, but it's one we feel very strongly. And that's why I tell people, visit botanic gardens and look at how those plants actually look. Take your tape measure or walk it off and say, oh, oh, that's this big by this big. And then you can get it in the right place or, or move it in the right place. Uh, any questions? Uh, I know we've covered a lot of stuff in a really yeah. fast uh, when, time. When you put a plant in the ground yes. so you mix it in with the original soil, how big, and they always say uh, go twice as big, Okay. and then I always kind of put it in the pile, mix the stuff in it, and then put it in okay. and bring it all back in. Okay. Is that okay. enough? No. Oh. Remember, are you, remember what I just showed you about roots? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so fixing an individual hole and adding stuff to that, unless it's a small perennial, it's absolutely worthless. It, it accomplishes zero because those roots are going to be out 40 feet away. Tree, yeah. yeah, trees, shrubs. Shrubs, shrubs are the same thing. Yeah. Now, if you're doing a very small perennial, it doesn't hurt to mix the stuff in, but otherwise, it's pretty much worthless. Okay. It just it gives you absolutely nothing because those roots are not going to stay there. So, yeah, you, you want to be sure you, your soil is broken up. That's the key is to add air to it. But that's why we do beds. And we, not only do we do beds, Every bit of lawn was prepared the exact same way as the beds. Every bit of lawn is 50% compost, 50% native soil. So it's a volume thing. You, to, to buy little bags of compost, it just it it makes people feel good, but it accomplishes nothing. I mean, it's 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 volume. I mean, realistically, now if you have an established area, what you can do is mulch and mulch constantly because what mulch is the, the, anybody know the difference between mulch and compost yes okay this is mulch 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 yes exactly mulch means you can tell what it used to be compost means you can't it's the same product so we always want a mulch that will decompose quickly like six months and then you're feeding the microbes so in an established garden that's how you get it into the soil, where you can't go in and redig and start from scratch. It's all about compost, compost, compost. And eventually, it'll start breaking down that soil and get you some air down to those microbes. You know, a lot of people, we talked earlier about people putting good soil on top of bad. A lot of people can't garden under trees because of the tree roots. So they'll fill the soil full. Well, within a month, it's full of tree roots. Okay, why is that? because the soil was not prepared well underneath the trees. Tree roots naturally want to go down. That's their mission is to go down. But if there's no air down there, there's no nutrients, and there's improper moisture, those roots are going to come up. So anytime you have roots coming up, that means that you did a crappy job preparing the soil underneath. That's, what that, that's like nature sending you a signal saying, hey, we... we, we not if you not if you had the soil prepared underneath that means there is bad soil underneath something they are not happy with tree roots do not naturally grow up they always naturally go down so so it, again that's just now, now there are ways to solve that but some of those can be a little expensive they're air spades so if you've got a, a bed where a tree is really large what they it's a technology they adopted from the uh, from the defense department 
where they would go into foreign countries that full of landmines and they had uh, big equipment they could come in with air hoses and they basically blast all the soil out and they can say oh landmine 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 you can see them so they've adopted that now to so the tree industry so they can go into a big tree that has the roots that want to grow up or a tree that people parked under or did stupid things to and they can go in and blast all the soil out then they mix it with compost put it right back in and the tree just explodes in it's incredible then you can garden underneath it so it's called air spading so a lot of the good tree companies now are able to do that and and it would have to be a pretty special tree or a special area but but that is that is absolutely an option if we, that's again that's that's correcting our screw-ups so ideally if we do things right to begin with we wouldn't have that problem other questions i know we've comp we talked a lot about a lot of things other other people having issues where you've moved in and things uh didn't quite make sense yes now <clears throat> there's a lot of people that promote a lot of really crazy mulches cedar is very prone to not decomposing okay the purpose of mulch the number one purpose is to feed the microbes so when you have a mulch like cedar that doesn't decompose you've defeated the entire purpose of having mulch that's why painted mulches are no good because they've been treated to keep them from decomposing brick mulches which i see people using now rubber mulches they don't feed the microbes if it does not feed the microbes probably shouldn't put it out so that so all all mulches are going to have fungus the faster it decomposes the more fungus he's going to have which he was correct there those fungus are not a problem they're, they're now people freak out there's a there's a beautiful yellow fungus called dog vomit fungus that's very common when you put out new pine bark mulch very common it affects nothing it's only there for a couple of days it disappears but people freak out. I mean, I'm on one of these things next door and everybody writes, what is this? What do I spray it with? How do I get rid of it? You go take a pill and chill out. It's not gonna bother anything. Oh my God, embrace it, post it on social media, but don't freak out. People, we, we, we live in a society of germaphobes. From the time I was I was raised is, is everything, every you know, TV's, uh, sensationalize germs they will go into the grocery store and they will look at a grocery cart and they will use ultraviolet light look at all the germs okay 99% of the germs are good for you just because you find a germ does not mean it's bad I mean that's the that's the problem people now everybody's getting sick because everybody is too healthy we use ant our, our microbiomes suck is that, when I was a kid, I ate dirt regularly when I was in kindergarten. I don't get sick now. I've, I've been, it's been 40-some years since I've been sick. I've got a damn good microbiome. I lead out in the garden. I don't wash my hands before I eat. That's no. We've sterilized ourselves to death. So in the gardens, fungus is good. Celebrate the fungus. There's a tiny, tiny amount of fungus that are bad. It's just minuscule. So don't freak out, please, when you see those. Great question. <laughs> right on cue. Any other great questions? Yes. How do we handle voles? We absolutely have voles. We, we, we didn't have them for years. We have a number of cats. Now, some cats are great, some suck. <laughs> so, so if you've got a bad cat, uh, there's a product. There's several products for voles. The one we like the best is Rosol. It's a little hard to find now. Uh, it's been replaced primarily by some warfarin-based products and, uh, and vitamin D. Turns out voles are not very healthy critters, and you can kill them with vitamin D. I'm not making this up, so they're little blocks about this big of vitamin D, and you can put those out. We, whatever we put out, we put a pot over it and make sure non-target things can, can't get in there because we don't know who else might be unhealthy out in the garden. But, the voles were glad to kill, so you need to cover them so that it's dark. 
where they eat. Then you, need, you have to repeat it every few days. If you're not going out there every few days, then don't bother starting. And you have to keep replacing it until they stop eating. The minute they stop eating, then you're good. Then what you need to do is go all around the perimeter of your property and keep them from coming back in from your neighbors who didn't do anything. <laughs> and what we do is take squares of black plastic about this big and lay it down, cover it with some mulch. Voles love black plastic. Don't ask me why, but they love it. And put a little rose all underneath, and if they try to come in for your neighbors, they'll stop for a snack, and then they never come back into your property. So, oh, rat snakes are incredible. Oh my God, yes, we love snakes. So, snakes, snakes are great, but you know, having a, a, a hawks are fantastic as well. So there are some natural ways, but honestly, uh, voles would be devastating here. So we, we, when we did a good job, we were actually able to get rid of them for about seven years. And then we, some of our staff just lost track of the border and they started coming back in. So you got to secure the borders once you eliminate what's here. Great question. Other questions? Okay. Yes, sure. Killing weeds. Yes. Yeah, they say not to use around up the stuff anymore because that's not good for the animals and all that. Thank you. So, what, what do you recommend for killing weeds when you got lots? Okay. Lots? Great question. All right, so, first thing about weeds, you have to understand the purpose of weeds. Weeds is nature's way of making sure the ground is never bare. So over the years, nature's put down what's called a weed seed bank. In our county of North Carolina, there are 7,000 weed seed per square foot of bare soil. Think about those numbers a minute. 7,000 per square foot of bare soil. You will either eliminate them before you plant or you will be dealing with them after you plant. So we prefer to get rid of them first. So a couple options. We started out here, we did everything called solarization. We spread out big pieces of plastic and we baked everything underneath. We baked all the weed seed. Worked great. Then somebody did some research and said, you kill light years more microbes using solarization than you do with something like Roundup. Roundup is actually not a bad chemical. Roundup is actually a wonderful chemical. I will say that. I don't recommend you eat it. I don't like crops that have been sprayed with it. I have a problem putting it in my body. But on the ground, used correctly, it is a growth regulator. It actually doesn't poison the plant. It causes the plant roots to grow themselves to death, which is why it doesn't kill things for like a week after you put it out. I just heard pollinators and stuff. Doesn't affect pollinators, no. no. It doesn't, doesn't affect pollinators. Not a, not a problem there. So, huh? What about preen? Preen is a pre-emergent. Pre-emergent, I don't personally like pre-emergents in a homeowner setting. Not saying you can't use them, but I like to be able to get down in the garden and work. Mm -hmm. Roundup is tied up just like that in the soil. Preen is not. The way pre-emergents work, you put them out, you water them in, they create a, a invisible boundary. Any weeds that try to grow up through it, it basically cuts it off. So if you're out there working in your garden, number one, once you disturb that, you've eliminated the effect of the pre-emergence. Number two, I just don't like chemicals on my hands. I just, just call me silly. Now, in large commercial areas, yes, they've got a use. But in homeowners, just not a fan of... Now, if you've got an area that's completely out of hand and you're, comp and you're getting ready to give up gardening, yes, use it. Then give it the time to... to uh, degrade and you will all that is is on the uh, the label so you can tell so it's it's not saying nothing is ever always good or always bad it's just understanding how you use that but I'm big fans of chemicals that you use to get to the point where you no longer need chemicals so what we do once we get rid of the seed bank and we plant we mulch some weeds require light to germinate some require dark. You have to understand which ones are which. If you mulch and then you allow weed seed to be blown in on top of the mulch, they will do really well. They will do even better. So what you have to do then is secure the downwind side. Where are the prevailing winds? For us, it's from the south. So you'll see we have a holly hedge or a fence all the way across on the south. 
that keeps new weeds from coming in. It's like a trap crop in farms. They would always plant where the weeds blew in from in the field to keep the weeds from blowing in. Now, no good in a hurricane. I get that. But you can eliminate 95% of your weeds that way. The other key is never allow a weed on your property to go to seed. The minute you do, you have just replenished the seed bank. So that's where it really requires a lot of uh, ability to, to actually go out and look and say, oh, that weed is starting to seed. I must get rid of the seed now. That's not something you wait a day. There's some weeds that by the time they germinate, they are flowering three days at, and dropping seed four to five days after they germinate. So it's, you, to, to eliminate, it's just like any enemy. You have to know the enemy. And once you know those weeds and you realize, all right, you got winter annual weeds and you got summer annual weeds. And then you got perennial weeds. Perennial weeds are there all the time. You get to enjoy them <laughs> without them even having to seed. But most winter weeds, they start coming up in September. So they'll come up September through winter. And then the summer weeds are starting to come up usually around the 1st of April. That would be your crabgrass, your spurge, your Dallas grass, things like that. So it's, it's re really, to, to be a good gardener, you have to understand and study weeds. So it was a long answer. Yeah. Grass. Like we have common Bermuda just because yeah. it came up. Okay? Yeah. And we can't get rid of it. But now, loves to get in your garden yeah and then you can't get it out well see all right so bermuda grass is is it would be a perennial weed because it's there year after year it's actually very easy to kill really? yeah yeah roundup is completely effective if it's in a bed you will need to use a graminicide okay and what a graminicide is it's a spray that only kills grasses you can spray it i could spray it over top of everything in this bed and the only thing it would bother is grasses it would not bother Carex, which look like grasses, because they're not grasses. It would not bother Liripe, which looks like a grass, because it's in the asparagus family. It only bothers things a true grass. Now, you may have to spray it two or three times. Roundup's pretty tough. One spray's not going to get it. So if you use something like Roundup, if it's out in the open, a typical uh, Roundup uh, spray is three ounces per gallon. That's considered full-strength Roundup. For Bermuda grass, I recommend one ounce sprayed three times at weekly intervals. So one ounce this week, one ounce per gallon, one ounce per gallon next week, one ounce per gallon the third week, and then your Bermuda will be dead. But, but one time on a plant with an extensive underground root system, that just pisses it off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That doesn't really kill it. It burned the top off and it'll be right back. Yeah. So, so the key is to realize you've got to kill the roots first not the top. What would you recommend for still grass? Still grass is an annual. It is a summer annual. So if, if you've got a bad infestation, you're going to have to go with a pre-emergent there. But the key is start in one area and do not let it put any more seed. The seed are late summer, early fall. You must stop the cycle. Begin Because it's an annual, you've got a great opportunity. That works. Yeah, if you don't have other plants around it, yes. Yeah. I've been managing with Roundup and just pulling them. Yeah. Still, still grass is probably one of the worst weeds. It was brought in as ballast on a ship. They had stuff packed in it. What is that? Still grass is called mile a minute weed. Still grass, it's a, it's a true grass. It's got very long things in one leaf every few inches. And it'll get up about this tall, yeah. It's a microstegium is the, uh, if you want to get really technical about it and address it correctly before you kill it. Uh, it's nasty stuff, I mean, it, it really is. But that's one of those cases I would almost say pre-emergent for one season. Because again, to me, chemicals are used to get to the place where you no longer need them. I don't, chemicals should not be something you use every year. It should be used, solve a problem and then don't let new weed seed blow in, and then you don't need the chemicals anymore. How far are uh, still grass seeds uh, carried by wind or animals? I don't know that anybody's ever looked at that. It'd be scary to even know. I mean, I'm in a sheltered area. And 
Yeah. Well, that's why we talked about earlier is hedging the downwind side. Look at what area is downwind where stuff's going to blow in from and put a hedge, put a wall, put a screen, put something up so you don't have that problem of new weed seed blowing onto your property. That's just, I can't tell you how important that is at solving your weed problems. Other questions? I had one. Yes. Mm -hmm. We just put them in. So we got one was ground down, looking fine. The other one has those little root sprouts coming up mm -hmm. everywhere. Yep. Hacking them with the axe and everything. Yeah. So We're not done with them. No. Would you recommend yeah. just putting a piece of cardboard and smothering them or something? Or? Yeah, yeah, good luck. Yeah, anywhere on a, on a root for a Bradford pear, <laughs> yeah. everywhere that root gets injured, mm -hmm. it's going to sprout up. So. If I was doing it, what I would have done when I cut the tree down, the minute I cut, not 10 minutes later, sprayed the stump with Roundup or pour some Roundup on the stump. Then it'll, it'll suck it back in and it kills all the roots and then you have no problem. So that's the key is to let the plant's natural system. Eventually, will you get rid of it? Maybe in a decade or so doing it your way. Uh, but I would, if, if you can, I would go in with some Roundup uh, every time you do that. Now, you've got a couple options. If you don't like spraying, uh, you can get a clip clean. Clip clean is a little attachment to hand clippers. It's a little tube that you put on your nice hand clippers, and you fill it full of Roundup. And every time you clip, it drips just a drop on what you just clipped. And that way, there's no spraying involved. There's no, it's called a clip clean. And it's, it's very, it, they were designed for people rooting cuttings to put rooting hormone in there. But they work really great with herbicides. And so every, everywhere you clip, it drips right on that. You can also do it with a little spray bottle if you, is also effective, but there are many ways. You always want to minimize, if you're using pesticides, minimize the amount you use to something very small. But to, the idea that they're not great tools for certain situations is, is sort of silly. Any other questions? I've got another one. Okay, fire away. Uh, I'm developing a, I'm trying to uh, turn my backyard into a wildflower meadow. So I... True wildflower meadows are pretty worthless in our climate. You've got the rain is an issue, the weed pressure is an issue. You get out in the Midwest, the West Coast, wildflower meadows are great. They don't have the weed pressures we have. So you first of all would have to get rid of the weed pressure before you do it for it to be a success. And, and in my world, you would have to go in, not just and kill the weeds, but you would have to till it to make sure the weeds at the top few inches are also dead. So the only way to napalm the air, basically. No, it's, it's just, it, it basically, what we did when we started this garden, we would go in, we'd spray an area. Once we got rid of the reeds, we'd till it up and we'd add our organic fertilizers, then we'd water it. We'd encourage more weeds, then we'd go in and kill those, and we'd do that until we could till it and no more weeds came up. It's doable, but it requires an incredible amount of patience. So the, the, the key for all wildflower meadows in here is, is weeds. I've not seen one that I would consider successful in this region. I'd be satisfied if it was like a, a, a fallow pasture. Yeah. yeah. And just let the grasses take over and then plug in some things. That, yeah. yeah. And there, there, there are a lot of ways, there are a lot of things you can do. You can use plants that are just really aggressive. Mm -hmm. And those will be fine. Those will, will be in there with the weeds. As long as you're not looking for something that's weed free, you plug in some pycnanthemums, plug in some things that reseed really easy. Yes, that may be completely acceptable to you, but it will not be a classic prairie. But, but yeah, they're, they're, anything that is too aggressive for a normal garden would be great for something like that. Solidago canadensis, one of our natives, a horrid, horrid weed. Beautiful. Plug that in. Uh, wild phlox, phlox paniculata. Uh, we got a couple of clones that just, they'll run 10 feet in a couple of years. Plug those in. Those would be great.